Hey guys, welcome back to Retro Gem Investments on YouTube. So I get a lot of people in the comments saying, hey Chase, what first print video games should I be investing in for my long-term portfolio? There's a lot of confusion and market manipulation regarding these items being perpetuated by unsophisticated investors in the greater antiques and collectibles trade. One of the main categories of items people are engaging in short-term speculation on is so-called first print video games, okay? In this particular video, we're going to analyze what makes an investment grade first print collectible, as opposed to the Timmy bullshit you might think is a first print after basic research and common sense. Now, you might think that the first print of a game means the first time a game was printed. No, that is a recipe for disaster for starry-eyed speculators who don't understand market fundamentals. So let's take a look at five examples of potential first print games so I could teach you the seven important steps to defining first print games according to Harry Rinker. Super Mario Brothers for the Famicom. This particular item was released in September of 1985. The American version was released in late 1985 to 1986. And the European and Australian versions came in 1987. So, this is the first print, right? No. Super Mario Brothers is a Japanese game, but games only matter when they come out in America. Have you ever heard of someone talking about the first Australian print of Super Mario Brothers? It just doesn't happen, guys. This is a key point I want you to understand, guys. Just look at comics, okay? An American institution where all of the characters, companies, writers, and artists are entirely American. And only the American first print matters. Look at currency. We've got American money, like an 1881 Carson City Morgan Silver Dollar that people buy so they can buy more first print comic books. Book collectors don't go after the first edition of a book from its country of origin. Wait, fuck, that is exactly what book collectors do. Cut this. So guys, for this game developed in Japan for a Japanese console by a Japanese company, remember, even though it originally came out in Japan, this is not the first print of the game. To think otherwise is racist. Let's move on to another example. The Legend of Zelda, the incredibly historic launch title for the Famicom Disk System in February 1986. Now, let's just pretend for a minute you're racist and you're going to consider this even though it's Japanese. It came out a year before the American version and nearly two years before the Australian and European versions. It's even a different format, it has different graphics and gameplay differences. This is obviously the first print of the game, right? Wrong. This is a rookie mistake made by unsophisticated collectors. This game is extremely common, guys. It's extremely easy to find it complete in the box and in investment grade. Here's the second key point. Common games cannot be first printings. You cannot monetarily benefit by accurately calling this game the first print. So it must be something else. Wada won't even grade this. The correct thing to do is focus on a different region and put pretend importance on this Zelda TM box as if this is the first Zelda game ever. Now I know exactly what you're thinking. You think you've got it figured out. You say, okay Chase, I'll just look up the first version of a game released in America that isn't super common and that's what you call the first print. So here it is, right? Super Mario 3 on the Play Choice 10, the first time Super Mario Bros. 3 was released in America. And these are probably uncommon enough to where you could call it a first print. So is this the first print? No. This is an important point of video game history, guys. Arcade games don't matter because they're really big and I don't want to think about that. They would be like hard to move and stuff. The same thing goes for computer games, because those are hard to install and I don't have a floppy drive, so how can that be a historical original game? This is why I can buy a Bubble Bobble arcade PCB for a couple hundred dollars, or a Bubble Bobble arcade cabinet for a few hundred dollars, but the sealed NES port of the game, the real first print, sold for $7,200 on Heritage Auctions. So don't be one of those Poindexters out there that thinks an original Donkey Kong arcade cabinet 
is a more historic and important item than a true grail like the shitty NES black box port that doesn't even have all the levels. Guys, here's where you might mess up, okay? I know the majority of people out there watching this on YouTube are sophisticated collectors. So this is a Left Bros Super Mario 3, but there's a date code on the inside flap. There are actually three different dates which this Left Bros Mario 3 box was produced with. So you're a Timmy. You think, okay, this is the first non-arcade American version of the game. It's at least somewhat uncommon, so I'm going to look up the earliest date code, and that's the print run from the real first print of the game, right? No. This is a twofer, guys. Point four, obscure information doesn't count. If not a lot of people know something, it can't affect the print run of a particular item. Even though we can deduce that these numbers are literally print run dates printed in YMMDD format, so 91219 is 1989, December 19th, this does not affect the logical print run. Because people don't know this, you should continue to hype up any Left Bros Mario 3 as a first print. Guys, if you're ever caught off guard by new information and you find out that what you once thought was a first print is no longer a first print, just try to casually shrug it off when someone brings it up and say, no one really cares about that. Because the difference between a trademark and a registered trademark symbol on a Zelda box can be $1,000 now. But a literal print run date printed on a Mario box who fucking cares? That's such an obscure, weird thing to care about. And the fifth point is that information you can't see when a game is in factory sealed condition doesn't count. Obviously, you don't want to hype up a first print with something you can only know by opening the box and then not be able to cash in on the big bucks because you can't tell if your sealed copy is actually a first print. We want this information to exist, but to be unknowable, okay? We want Schrodinger's Game, where all print runs exist in a state of being both first print and not first print at the same time. That way, we can all be rich collectively. Now guys, these are two Castlevania hang tabs. They're the first American, non-arcade, non-computer, uncommon, well-known versions of Castlevania. One has the original big logo cartridge, and one is the revised small logo cartridge. But we're ignoring that, because remember, information you can't see when a game is factory sealed doesn't count. So, these are the first prints of this game, right? Well, yes, but let me explain. A while back on Nintendo Age, I mean before Daddy Go Collect turned it into the Game Information Encyclopedia by archiving or removing literally all knowledge on the site, and turning away the entire user base, I saw this forum post about Castlevania hang tabs saying there might be a difference between these two boxes. Now, I can't find the post again because Daddy Go Collect search function is completely fucking useless. To prevent Timmy Poindexter Juniors like me from finding any relevant information, I don't already have hoarded away in my spreadsheets. Anyway, I remember this forum post saying there was slightly shifted art between these two releases. And indeed, the box for the revised cartridge is printed a couple millimeters higher than the other one. Now, I don't know if this is just regular printing variants or a separate print run, because I can't find anyone else who has ever discussed this. And the original forum post is lost in the asshole of Daddy Go Collect. So this is either deep, deep NES variant knowledge or nothing at all. I honestly don't know, guys. And this brings us to our final two points. Point six. If you're not sure, pretend it doesn't exist. There's no benefit to trying to get to the bottom of this, because if this is a real variant, it's only going to hurt the feelings of people who now realize what they once thought was a first print is now worthless. Remember point four. If you get caught on the wrong side of new information, deny, deny, deny. It's just a minor difference between print runs. Who cares about print runs anyway? And the last point, guys. If you discover new information, keep it to yourself. Daddy Go Collect realized this quickly, that the best way they could service collectors is by taking all of the easily accessible, searchable information offline and hoarding it to themselves for monetary benefit. As a sophisticated investor, you have the obligation to do this too. If you figure out an obscure variant, whether it's on NES 
or Xbox, Dan, you keep that motherfucking information quiet. You don't mention it on Instagram. You don't bring it up in a YouTube video. You start calling up game stores and sniping eBay to hoard every last one of those variants before some other Poindexter out there figures it out and starts talking about it because they think it's interesting. So that's it guys. To recap, one, the actual first release of a Japanese game from Japan doesn't count. Two, it can't be a first print if it's easy to find. Three, no arcade or computer games because oh geez, I don't wanna think about those. Four, obscure information does not count. Five, information inside a factory seal does not count. Six, if you're not sure, pretend it doesn't exist. And seven, if you find out, hoard that information to yourself. With these steps and this information, you are on your way to being a sophisticated first print investor in the antiques and collectibles trade. Remember, it's not about history or accuracy or researching the hobby. It's about making money with short-term speculation. Because if you're actually putting effort into this investment shit, I know you guys are buying coins, currency, collectible first edition books, historical documents, and art. Not this pop culture fad bullshit. Guys, I hope this video has served you well. If it did, please let me know in the comments. Please consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel. Thank you again for joining me on our quest to analyze these segments of the greater antiques and collectibles trade and have a great night. I'm headed to the gym.